Hello fellow future enthusiasts. On Demystifying, we do deep dives on science, futurism, and speculative technology. My name is Thor, and I will be your host today. Since before the beginning of spaceflight, man has applied his willingness to brute force complex problems by shooting huge cannons into the sky. Jules Verne was born in 1828. He saw the growing role of science in an industrial society, lived through the American Civil War, and etched his ideas into the annals of science fiction. In his novel, From the Earth to the Moon, Verne imagined a project initiated in the wake of the Civil War, where gigantic smoothbore cannons called Columbiads were used in sieges by both sides. In the novel, people launch humans into space using modified Columbiads at a time when neither science nor society had seriously contemplated such a journey. Although science would need decades to catch up to the ideas in his book, Jules Verne had already derived relatively accurate calculations to find the size of the gun needed as well as the projectile mass of a crew-carrying capsule. Fast forward some 110 years to German-occupied France at the height of the Second World War. Germany has initiated its Vengeance Weapons program, producing the V-1 and V-2 rocket. A lesser-known third design, the V-3 or Busy Lizzie, is also devised. The V-3 was a complex of massive subterranean tubes, which used a combination of rocket-propelled ammunition and multiple explosive charges to boost a warhead to extreme velocity. While this system was designed to shell English cities from France, engineers have noted in retrospect it would have been able to place objects into low-Earth orbit if slightly modified. While of a similar capability, the V-3 was not a true gas gun. Instead of using a lighter-than-air propellant, the V-3 used multiple successive explosions to overcome the normal speed limit of a shell. Combustion light gas guns, or CLGGs, are projectile launchers using chemical energy derived from gas, usually hydrogen. They function by compressing a piston of gas mixture, thus pressurizing and then detonating it. Gas guns can achieve hypervelocity speeds determined by the composition and pressure of the gases used, allowing them to be used to initiate nuclear fusion or fission. As the physics of light gas guns came into grasp of science following the conclusion of World War II, the first adopters were experimental military projects. Super High Altitude Research Project, or SHARP, was the first serious application of the gas gun concept, intending to shoot down ICBMs by the mid-1990s. The program saw some success, accelerating a 5 kilogram mass to 3 kilometers per second at around 450 kilometer altitude in testing. But this is far short of the 7.8 kilometers needed to achieve orbit. Following the mixed success of SHARP, the next space gun program would occur not in the US, but Iraq, commissioned by Saddam Hussein. Artillery engineer Gerald Bull, who worked on Sharp, was commissioned by Hussein to build the Project Babylon gun to allow Iraq access to space. Bull, who was graduate of the University of Toronto, was assassinated because of his involvement, and all parts of the Babylon gun were destroyed at the end of the Gulf War. Lead Sharp developer John Hunter started two companies to continue work privately, the Jules Verne Launcher Company and Quick Launch. Quick Launch's activity ceased in 2016 due to the rise of competitor SpaceX, eventually birthing another company called Green Launch, who continues work to this day. Looking at the real-world history of this tech, it's reasonable to ask, well, if LGGs come with all these benefits, why has no space project with them ever been successful? The answer to this question includes factors like high-risk development and the competitive economics of payload design and architecture. In today's world, we are entirely reliant on chemical rockets to reach orbit, and this reality influences the accessibility of alternatives. Some concepts, such as spin launch, are being tested, which use centripetal force to sling small rockets to high altitude. Spin launch's inevitable reliance on a final stage chemical booster highlights how we do not currently have a method to achieve orbit without chemical rockets playing some kind of role. In our early 2020s SpaceX-dominated reality, 
Potential payload designers and investors are most interested in finding the lowest possible cost per kilogram of payload. Space access ventures that do not ride on the success of some proven technology are extremely risky in comparison. With the existence of a competitive and reliable launch provider, the worst outcome of looking for an alternative is not a failed development project, but a successful one that is still more expensive than the existing options, after R&D cost. New space access tech like space elevators, inertial launchers, and gas guns suffer when presented as commercial ventures due to the risk and unpredictability of testing novel systems. This explains why private interest into gas guns for space has remained low. Gas guns are not game-changing tech on their own, but by pairing them with other well-developed space access systems, we can use them to do most of the work needed to bring a payload to Earth orbit. By the end of today's video, we'll have an outline of a total space access solution predicated on gas guns, capable of moving payloads not only to low orbit, but also potentially to the moon. Gas guns may have one or more gas pistons used to drive the projectile. Typically, the gas inside is detonated and the rapid rise in pressure is contained behind a rupture disc or other mechanical valve system. The gas is only allowed to reach the neck of the barrel holding the projectile when it reaches a predetermined pressure. Expanding gases produced by an explosion such as those used to propel bullets and shells are limited by the speed of sound. This doesn't mean you cannot accelerate projectiles beyond the speed of sound. It simply means the propagation of forces between the expanding gas molecules is limited by an elastic speed limit dependent on the chamber pressure. As the projectile is pushed down the barrel, less and less of the expanding gas is able to exert a force, even though the pressure inside the chamber may still be increasing as propellant burns. Light gas guns increase the speed of sound in the propellant material by pressurizing it before detonation. The rapid movement of the piston creates this pressure, which via a process known as adiabatic heating also rapidly heats this gas, increasing its ability to conduct energy even further. The speed of sound in pure hydrogen is around 3.8 times that in normal sea level air, which allows pressure to be transferred through pure hydrogen much faster than air or typical exhaust gases, resulting from a chemical explosion. The superheated hydrogen can even be trapped and recycled for use in other applications or for future launches. In order to reach Earth's orbit, the payload must reach a velocity higher than its orbital velocity, since it will lose some of its speed to air resistance. This means that if the gun alone is used to reach orbital velocity, a muzzle velocity in excess of 7.8 kilometers would be needed. While the payload can be engineered to reduce air resistance, 7.8 kilometers is a lot of speed for an object to take on in a short period of time no matter what. Extreme pressures and long barrels are needed to produce this velocity, so engineering problems become more severe as we attempt to achieve greater muzzle velocities. Proposals have discussed using partially underwater cannons to simplify this design, since water can be used to keep the barrel stable across larger distances. We need to find a way to boost the payload with additional velocity after it has left the launcher, this much is clear. There are several possibilities here, each with their own shortcomings. The most obvious method is to equip the payload itself with a small rocket motor to increase velocity after it has left the dense lower atmosphere, such as Spin Launch proposes. This adds mass to the payload, increasing the energy needed for the initial acceleration, and this method is not ideal since the goal is to reduce the energy needed for the initial launch. We have a solution to this problem not using chemical rockets, but sky tethers or space hooks. Next, we'll use data from real-world proposals to confirm a gas gun space hook exchange system. The payload is fired at a steep angle, allowing most of the energy of its launch to go towards gaining altitude. Most of the horizontal speed needed to achieve orbital velocity is added later by a series of consecutive space hooks. Payloads are traveling at around Mach 11, or 3.8 km per second, when they encounter the first hook. This accelerates the payload to Mach 17, or 5.8 km per second, after which it intercepts the final hook, placing the payload in an equatorial orbit at around 700 km 
at a speed of 7.8 kilometers per second. These space hooks would orbit in groups at set altitudes between 525 and 650 kilometers to facilitate rapid lofting of cargo. When a space hook is used, it expends some of its kinetic energy working on the payload mass and will lose altitude and speed. To accommodate a constant flow of cargo, several space hooks are placed along the flight path so that one is always in position to receive a payload while the other is recovering. The space hook or sky tether rotates quickly, being spun up until the angular velocity of its weighted ends is equal to the velocity of the incoming payload. The lowest strata of sky hooks would be in an equatorial orbit of around 600 kilometers and are about 425 kilometers long. They are made of a cable of Vectran fibers surrounded by a sleeve of plastic to resist exposure to molecular oxygen. The tether rotates in a direction opposite the motion of the surface below, dipping the hook end deep into the Earth's atmosphere at an altitude of around 175 kilometers. At its lowest point, the tether is stationary relative to the ground for a few moments, allowing it to attach to a mass and fling it to a higher orbit. When you add in the orbital velocity of the tether, then this tether can also intercept payloads moving quickly over the surface, such as those fired from a gas gun. Conservation of energy means that the tether pays for the boost by losing some of its altitude. There are at least two options for replacing the expended energy. Either a charge can be applied across the length of the tether to gain altitude via Lorentz force without much effort, or a more complex approach using chemical thrusters or ablation can be used. It seems a bit counterproductive to build a space hook system and have it derive its energy from a chemical rocket engine or even an electric propulsion system, so thankfully there is a more elegant solution available. Space hooks are equally useful for accelerating and decelerating, so an ideal arrangement would see space hooks alternate between outgoing and incoming payloads. Each parcel launched into orbit causes a loss of altitude, which is regained by capturing a parcel arriving from interplanetary space bound for Earth's surface. Currently, the biggest challenge to space hooks is the tensile strength of the tethers. The mass of our cargo will be limited until stronger materials are developed. Well, technically, we have materials strong enough now. We don't need carbon nanotubes and other sophisticated future materials to do this. The bigger problem is producing such material in sufficient quantities. A 400 kilometer long tether is no small project. Throughout the history of space hook and light gas gun development, material science is highlighted as the most important factor to realizing and employing these structures. And of course, when you remove the two biggest restrictions on the gas gun concept, gravity and air resistance, you can expand the operational envelope of these systems in locations like the Moon and Mars. On Luna, the need for space hooks disappears. Light gas guns can be shot directly into intersections with orbital assets or even fired at Lagrange points nearby. However, space hooks are still practical on Luna because they allow payload bundles to be redirected into an orbit from their original trajectory. This means supplies can be put into an orbital plane without the presence of a capture array or a waiting vehicle. Space hooks on Luna can be much heavier and larger than on Earth and will likely be made using lunar materials. One day, we may see such a gas gun and skyhook system extend even into deep space, where they may work in fleets to boost cargo around the inner planets. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed today's content. Please leave a comment with any questions or statements you have, and please like and subscribe to help grow our audience. Thank you.